from the New Arts and Media Studios in Milwaukee. I'm Charles Purcell. This is The Log. Well, President Joe yesterday toured New York and New Jersey, damaged from Hurricane Ida. This is crazy, you guys. The damage and the loss of life as this hurricane just barreled across the country. It hit land in New Orleans. I guess most people in New Orleans have power back now. Not all of them, though. And yeah, it just ripped across the country. And the the damage in the Northeast, beyond anybody's expectations. Scientists have warned about extreme weather for decades, and the U.S. doesn't have any more time to confront it, President Joe said. Reading now uh, NBC News website. Yeah, he's talking tough about climate change. I'll be very happy to see if that translates into any action. I can't tell you that my hopes are high. Biden signed disaster declarations for both states, New Jersey and New York, over the weekend, which will provide them with access to federal assistance through the Department of Homeland Security and the Federal Emergency Management Agency. The White House is also asking Congress to provide at least $10 billion for recovery from the hurricane and $14 billion for other natural disasters an administration official said. And uh, yeah, people say we can't afford. (laughs) We can't. God bless America. We can't afford to fight climate change. We have to think about jobs and the economy. Yeah, uh, 10 billion here, 14 billion there, and it's only going to get worse and worse over the years. We can't just treat this thing like any old uh, natural disaster from the old days. These aren't natural disasters. These are man-made disasters, and they can only be thwarted by extreme and immediate climate action. And we are nowhere near that. All right, okay. So, President Joe, on the move. Like I said the other day, he's got a lot to show. He's got a lot to prove. He's got to get, he's got to get legislation passed. He's got to sign some damn bills. He has to get us going in the right direction on a lot of issues. And right on top of the list, climate crisis. There's no more, there's no more waiting around. But you might say, well, we can't primary the guy, as I've been recommending unless he really shows huge progress in the next several months here. Once those 22 midterms come, we got to primary the guy when we get into back into presidential campaign mode. But you say, oh, well, we can't do that. What if the Republicans win? I know. Yeah, I know it's a catch-22. Sure it is. I don't want conservatives in any more than you do, but we can't, we can't keep diddling around with centrist Democrats. It's one step forward, 10 steps back, and uh, with, with increasing urgency. All right, in other news, ex-FBI official says law enforcement needs to take upcoming right-wing rally in D.C. very seriously. CNN Politics now, they interviewed uh, Andrew McCabe. You may remember Andrew McCabe, former FBI director, right in the middle of the whole uh, Orange Menace impeachment fiasco. McCabe said Monday evening that law enforcement needs to take the upcoming right-wing rally in support of jailed January 6 rioters very seriously as concerns mount about more potential violence on Capitol Hill. If you haven't heard of this yet, yeah, um, they are planning a a rally and they're calling the January 6 insurrectionists uh, martyrs and political prisoners and they're going to rally on their behalf September 18th is the planned date for what they're calling the Justice for J6 rally. Law enforcement members in Washington are steeling themselves against possible unrest. The rally aims to support the insurrectionists charged in the riot. The event, organized by a former campaign staffer, has prompted security concerns on Capitol Hill, and some precautionary measures will be in place. However, it's unclear how many protesters plan to attend. The rally is also taking place on a Saturday when the House will be on recess, so far fewer lawmakers or staff will be around. All right, well, there's a little bit of good news. The point is, we have to know this is happening. Again, it's September 18th is the plan. 
Proud Boys and the whole cast of characters are involved. And uh, they, have, they still have the support of certain members of Congress who are fighting with every tool in their toolbox to uh, stop, to obstruct the January 6th committee and other investigations. So just a little reminder here, this ain't over by a long shot. And once more, how it plays into politics, I don't know. I don't know. My mantra is always the same. Good policy is good politics. Take a firm stand. I'm happy with what the January 6th committee is doing. They've got all these subpoenas out. They've got all these requests for documents to, you know, every conceivable agency in the federal government. They got requests out to all telecommunications uh, corporations, companies to get their uh, phone records, et cetera, emails, et cetera. So, yeah, they're doing the right thing. I'm, I, I have no criticism there. They're doing what they need to do. They're going wide. They're going broad. They're going deep. So good for them. So, yeah, go hard on all of this stuff. And Joe, as I mentioned earlier, you got to go hard on everything, on the pandemic, on climate crisis, on voter suppression, on uh, the uh, attack on women's rights. Just go hard on everything. Just no apologies. Good policy is good politics. Do it. And then let the 22 midterms fall where they may. Let the 24 presidential election fall where it may. We can't play politics with this stuff. It's way too serious. We can't be making calculated decisions. We have to just go big. Uh, What else is going on here the last couple days of headlines? What else is going on out there? So Jon Stewart, still beloved by many. Of course, a host of The Daily Show. Very popular, groundbreaking program in its day. Jon Stewart, though, I don't know. He's got a new show coming out. It's going to be on Apple TV Plus, so I won't see it. It's called It's called The Problem with Jon Stewart. It's a multi-season single-issue series, whatever that means, that will take a deep dive on the most important topics that are currently part of the national conversation. So a little bit of a copycat of John Oliver's Last Week Tonight. One topic per show, take a deep dive. And uh, John Stewart's a pro, and he's going to have a good team of producers and writers, and I'm sure it'll be fine. My problem with John Stewart is just way too damn centrist, and he takes himself so seriously as a pundit. I'm always complaining about uh, Bill Maher. I kind of put Bill Maher and John Stewart in the same camp, though John Stewart isn't this kind of crazy libertarian like uh, like Maher is. Their politics are a little bit different. But where they're similar, they're, they're too damn centrist. They just refuse to go lefty. They can't do it. They don't have the courage or they, they honestly don't believe it's the right way to go. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to say too many bad things about John Stewart. He's a good guy. He created a great show in The Daily Show. Well, he didn't create The Daily Show, but he made it what it is. And then uh, all of his great work on behalf of 9-11 responders and all of that. Yeah, he's a good guy. I'm not going to badmouth John Stewart, but I think he's off base. I think he's too uh, centrist. I think he's too both sidesy. He also, one of his great claims to fame, one of his, one of his great moments in his career, when he went on CNN, and it was one of those, oh, which oh, I forgot the name of the show. It was one of those shows where, you know, you put a conservative on one side and a so-called liberal on the other, which is really just a centrist and in media terms. And then they battle it out and they fight. And, and he went on and told them both to their face on live television that they were ruining America. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> good going. That was one of his uh, bright and shining moments. Uh, and I wish he would take it to heart when he pulls his own both sidesism, which he does. Yeah, he's a liberal. Yeah, but he's he's the capital L liberal. He's the American version of the liberal, which is really a devout centrist. And in the end, it's like just, you know, can't we all get along without ever, ever taking a real hard stand on something? Uh, you know, take a stand, John Stewart. The show will be quality, I'm sure. It might even be really good. But in the end... I remember reading some critique 
way back when the uh, Daily Show was was really on a roll. I mean, he was on the cover of every magazine. Everybody was writing about him. And one comment that I read that always stuck with me is <laughs> a lot of us have a tendency to watch a program like that and just take great satisfaction in the program and in ourselves and we just we nod our head and we we agree and oh yeah why we can't why can't we get along and why can't the powers that be just have some common sense and see what's right and we get all this sort of self satisfaction out of just watching a program and then we feel like we've done our activism for the day as though watching the daily show with John Stewart in uh, the late 90s or early 2000s was uh, all we needed to do that was that was our activism and there's a false sense of satisfaction in agreeing with this very articulate and humorous and funny host of this cutting edge program oh aren't we great aren't we cool yeah you know that was a good commentary it stuck with me and i i recognized a little bit of myself in that and i had to take stock and think yeah you know, that ain't it. Number one, you got to do more than sit on your couch and watch a television show. And number two, and this is kind of what I realized later, you have to take a damn stand. This always waffling on the fence, this, this very comfortable capital L liberal centrism is just such a disaster. And you think Jon Stewart's going to get a show on Apple TV Plus if he's a radical? No, of course not. He's the perfect candidate for, for that kind of a program, for that kind of corporate sponsorship. No corporate-sponsored media is going to give a radical a half hour every night or even every week. All right, okay, let's drop a little good news on you. Uh, it's back to school this week for lots of kids and college students as well. The UW, University of Wisconsin system, returns here in my beloved Wisconsin. And uh, <laughs> a little good news, to my amazement, UW-Madison, the, the flagship campus there at, in Madison, state's capital, 90% vaccinated students, faculties, everybody, 90%. And they didn't even have a mandate. They strongly suggested but they did it. Just further proof that this is absolutely a political thing. People want to deny that, especially people on the right want to deny. But of course, Madison is the, uh, it's the Berkeley of the Midwest. It's this great liberal bastion in an otherwise pretty uh, redneck state. For those of you outside of Wisconsin, Milwaukee and Madison are the two liberal strongholds and everybody else is, you know, Alabama. And you get these little pockets, mostly in college towns, places like La Crosse and River Falls and Green Bay, uh, wherever there's a state university, you have these uh, small pockets, at least, of liberals. And uh, yeah, their, their vaccination rates are pretty good. Other state campuses, also high numbers, but Madison, 90%. Can you imagine if... If the rest of the country, if the whole damn country was at 90%, which we absolutely could be if we wanted it, if the people wanted it, we could be at 90%. We could wipe this damn thing off the face of the earth. That and get the vaccinations out to the rest of the world, which is a, in a related story here. There's more pressure on uh, President Joe and other world leaders to get this damn vaccine out to the rest of the world. It's, it's just beyond belief that we can hold any kind of intellectual property rights on a vaccine. Come on, man, give it the Jonas Salk treatment and just hand it out. Write up the recipe and, and, and email it out to every damn country on the planet. Everybody's got scientists and researchers and doctors, you know. They're not a bunch of shithole countries. They're, they're modern countries with modern cities and, and with qualified experts and uh, doctors and researchers. Hand out the damn recipe. Let them manufacture it. Let them distri distribute it. Give them the financial help they need. Just do it. 
my God. The, and it's, it's not even, it, it's not really all, that altruistic. It's just, it just makes sense from a practical level. The, uh, where did the, where did the Delta virus, uh, the Delta variant start out? India? I forget now. But the point is, a variant can start anywhere and reach our shores. That's just the way viruses work. You don't have to be a big old expert to know that. So it's the right thing to do. It's the moral thing to do. It's the, and it's the practical thing to do. So just do it it's for every reason in the world. The only reason not to share this vaccine recipe, as I'm calling it, there's only one reason. Money, 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 money. Profit, profit of, of U.S. pharma. There ain't no other reason. It's the only reason. The fact that anybody should be making any money off of this is just beyond my comprehension. All right, so congratulations to um, the University of Wisconsin system and especially to the, uh, the main campus there in Madison. 90% vaccination. Good for you guys. And we'll see, you know, we'll see what this new school year brings. That We've already had, I forget the number, hundreds of schools have had to close already because of huge breakouts. And of course, you I mean, I don't have to tell you, kids are getting this thing, kids are going to the hospital, kids are dying. So we'll see. We'll see what the fall brings. Um, oh, here we go. This caught my eye. <laughs> Robert E. Lee, Confederate general, standing or sitting tall on his horse in Richmond, Virginia, finally coming down. I think they said Wednesday, so it might be down as we speak. We'll see... Uh, We'll see when it happens. Yeah, it's the big one. 12-ton statue of Confederate General Robert E. Lee sits on the historic Monument Avenue in Richmond, Virginia, set to be taken down Wednesday, state officials said earlier this week. Governor Ralph Northam announced his intention to remove the Confederate statue, which is the largest remaining in the U.S. in June 2020, amid nationwide protests for racial justice, but was challenged in court a group of Richmond residents sued, arguing that an 1890 deed and an 1889 General Assembly joint resolution prohibits the governor from directing the removal of a state monument from state property. So it went through the courts. Uh, the governor won, and it's coming down about damn time. Apparently there are security concerns, so just like our concern with the uh, September 18 rally, on behalf of the January 6th insurrectionists, we have to worry about nut jobs in Virginia protesting uh, this removal. Hopefully that goes without a hitch, but we'll be watching that too. Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm looking for some good news. Slow progress here. Taking down, <laughs> taking down a statue of a Confederate general in 2021. I mean, God... We'll take good news where we can get it. How come this didn't happen 100 years ago? Or, or even immediately following the Civil War, how any of these statues ever got up in the first place is beyond me. And, you know, I'm sure you know the story. A lot of these statues, they, they weren't erected until the 20s and 30s and even the 40s and 50s when all of the uh, white supremacists were concerned about losing their position. So they wanted to... Uh, put it up on a pedestal to show everybody, hey, we're still in charge here. So a lot of these monuments, they're not from the Civil War era at all, or even the post-Civil War era. They're from the, some of the most racist eras in our history, 20s, 30s, 50s, backlash against black progress, civil rights movement of the 50s, all sorts of things are happening. So, so there's that. And, uh, well, let's go back down to Texas for a minute. It's now official. It was already pretty much signed, sealed, and delivered, but the Texas Governor Abbott made it official yesterday when he signed the voting restriction bill into law. It's now law. Texas Republican Governor George Abbott on Tuesday signed into law a bill that bans 24-hour and drive through voting, imposes new hurdles on mail-in ballots, and empowers partisan poll watchers. The restrictive voting measure adds Texas to the list of Republican-controlled states that have seized on former President Donald Trump's lies 
about widespread voter fraud and clamp down on access to the ballot box this year. Already, Florida, Georgia, and other states have enacted new voting laws. And uh, just to point out what I've tried to a couple of times, there's a lot of bad things in these laws, a lot of bad things about voter ID, about the things I mentioned here, 24-hour and drive through voting, uh, drop boxes, things like that, all, all disturbing. But to me, the most disturbing of all is that they hand power to uh, partisan legislators, to Republican legislatures. They now have usurped the power of local election officials. What the Orange Menace tried to do in Georgia with his phone calls to the uh, Secretary of State Basically, all these new state laws are making what he tried to do now legal. Now the uh, partisans are able to override elections, quite literally. They can pick and choose which votes count, which ones don't. They can go in and fuzzy up the numbers just the way the Orange Menace wanted when he said, find me 11,000 votes. They can do that now, legally, by state law, because that's the only reason... Uh, Raffensperger uh, from Georgia didn't do it because he couldn't do it. It was it was illegal by state law. Well, it's not illegal anymore. Georgia took care of that. And now Texas and, as mentioned here, Florida and others ready to go. Uh, speaking of Texas, we all know, obviously, it's not only the voter suppression law. It's the handmade tail attack on human rights for women. Uh, again, copycat laws in every red state. So let's start with Texas. Uh, here are the companies headquartered in Texas that you need to stop doing business with immediately. They are AT&T, Cisco, Dell, USAA, 7-Eleven, ExxonMobil, Pizza Hut, JCPenney, Dr. Pepper, Michael's, What's that? Is that the, 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 uh, is Michael's the uh, craft store? I think so. Whole Foods Market. There you go. Liberals. Can you do it? American Airlines and South uh, West Airlines, Southwest Airlines. So some of these are more sort of business to business like Cisco. But yeah, many of these are everyday transactions you might be making. So purge yourself again from AT&T, Dell, 7-Eleven, Exxon, Pizza Hut, JCPenney, Dr. Pepper, Michaels, Whole Foods Market. Liberals, put your money where your mouth is. Whole Foods Market, boycott them and let them know. American Airlines, Southwest Airlines. And my advice always, when you are engaging in a boycott, you have to do it loudly, not quietly. You don't just... You don't just withdraw your business. You do withdraw your business, but you make sure they know about it. You tell them. You tell the local owner, manager, whatever. You write letters to the headquarters. You tell people. You tell your elected representatives. I am boycotting AT&T et al. for the foreseeable future until such laws are reversed, are abolished. And that reminds me, let's uh, go ahead and remind you now, the general strike is scheduled for October 15th. And you know, along with the general strike, I always add the uh, boycott as well. General strike, general boycott, Friday, October 15th, 2021. Go to octoberstrike.com for details and support. So along with that, you want to boycott those Texas companies. And again, whenever you boycott, do it loudly. Make sure everybody knows. Make sure your governor knows. Make sure the president knows. Make sure the companies know. Your elected representatives. Everybody. Boycott loudly. And I would love to see my capital L centrist liberal friends do what needs to be done and put Whole Foods out of business unless and until they come out forcefully and do something about these heinous bills that attack the human rights of women. All right. Well, there's my rant for the day. Uh, I got just a couple minutes left. Let me take a minute for a personal pitch here. I've talked to you in the past about your local community radio station. Uh, 
I had the good fortune of being affiliated with River West Radio here in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And I got to tell you once again, it's just the most wonderful thing in the world. Um, when it comes to the media we consume, so much of it is tailored to our vanity. It's tailored to our fears. It's tailored to manipulate us. In the case of social media, it's specifically designed to make us anxious, to make us angry. <laughs> I can tell you myself, maybe that you've experienced this. You know, uh, the posts that say suggested for you, the little banner on top. Meaning that, of course, as we all know by now, they have algorithms and they can they know us better than we know ourselves. So they're going to give us things that we're going to want to read, right? So that's the way supposedly it's supposed to work. It's supposed to enhance our experience. Well, I can tell you from my personal experience, and maybe you share this, every post I get that's topped with the banner suggested for you, it's always, and I mean always, some sort of crazy right-wing, anti-vax, anti-mask, ultra-conservative, deplorable kind of a post. Obviously, if this algorithm knows me so well, it knows that that post is going to make me angry. It knows that I'm going to disagree vehemently with that post. And, it, and it's that very algorithm that's showing it to me. So it's their intention to make me upset, to make me anxious, to make me angry. I implore you, spend as little time as possible on corporate media, whether it's the networks, the cable guys, whatever streaming service is being, you know, beamed into your house and especially social media, when, when there are such wonderful alternatives, I couldn't be more proud to be affiliated with River West Radio. I say this now because it's kind of a special time over at the station. It's the new fall lineup, so many of the old regulars have come back, and there's a couple of new offerings, and it's all kind of very exciting. And I had the opportunity to put together, I put together some promos for the various programs. And all volunteer hosts, it's a, a whole volunteer operation, members of the community. But it gave me the opportunity to really sit down and listen to a lot of these shows. And I got to tell you, I was already in love with the station, <laughs> with the concept of community radio, but it really hit home. It made me stop and listen and just further appreciate the depth and the wonder and the genuine nature of this kind of communication, of this kind of media. So it just, it was on my mind. And I wanted to share this with you and to ask you once again, seek out your community media, your community newspaper, your neighborhood newspaper. If you have a neighborhood radio station, maybe a low power FM community radio station, there's got to be something near you. If there's nothing at all, start something up. There is absolutely nothing as beautiful and as important as community media. And the less time you can spend with the corporate garbage, the better. And the more time you can spend with your neighbors, the better. All right, just want to leave you with that. I'll talk to you tomorrow. I love you. I'm Charles Purcell.